Father, help us be with us, speak to us. Holy Spirit, we need you. Just teach us, God, uh, supernaturally what you want us to hear, what you want us to understand. God, we can never do justice to to making enough of you and, and to giving you the praise and worship that you are due, that you're, you deserve. But Father, I pray that our lives uh, will, will be that praise song, Father, that ultimate gift to you. And so teach us how to do that more today. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, uh, we left off, we, we were talking about some things that may keep you from, from living that new life, from being a new creation. And sometimes we look around and it seems like, man, everybody has this joy and they, they feel something I don't feel. They're getting something I'm not getting. And we talked about eight reasons why you may not be getting that. So that's on uh, iTunes, if you missed that, uh, www.thewoodbridgechurch.com. If you scroll down there, um, obviously through our website, you can uh, you can go into iTunes, or you can just go to iTunes and look at thewoodbridgechurch.com and get that. Number eight, the the eighth reason that we listed is possibly that uh, that you don't know God. So maybe the reason you're not hearing from God is that you don't. You don't really know who He is. Maybe you haven't truly accepted Him. If that's been resonating in your heart over the past week, we really want to pray with you about that today. That's why we're here, right? So, uh, anyways, that's where we left off. And this is the scripture that we left off on. And I want to pick back up here today. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 37 is where we're going to be today. Uh, Acts is in the New Testament. If you're not familiar with the Bible, you've come to the right place. It's okay. We don't expect you to be a Bible scholar. Uh, if if, if we were all experts, we wouldn't need this, right? So that's why we're here. Uh, but anyways, if you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles here. We would love for you to take one. It's not a burden for the church. Please don't think that. Please, please, please take one. We would love for you to do that. Uh, there by the door. You could even go get one now. Uh, Walker's standing there in the back. If you don't have one, he'll bring one to you. But please, uh, please take one of those. If you're not familiar with the Bible, it's broken up into two sections. There's Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament is the record of God creating the world and choosing His people and promising that one day a Savior, a Christ, the Messiah, Jesus would come. Right? And the New Testament is when Jesus comes and He changes everything. And um, so you just got to read it to believe it, right? So that's where we are today is in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the story of how the church began. Chapter 2, verse 37, the Apostle Peter, like one of Jesus' right-hand men, right? Um, Peter's speaking in verse 37, Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And so a lot of us are asking that question, like, okay, I believe this gospel thing, so what should I do? Verse 38, Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is to you, to your children, and those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Okay? Alright, Pastor, I get that. So, the Bible says, repent, turn of your sins. And so, for many of you, I would say, you know, the first step in obedience, you say, you know what, maybe I haven't, but now I do, I believe in Christ. Um, my, my urge and my challenge to you would be, would you follow in baptism? Jesus wants you to give an outward sign of your inward heart. And so I would challenge you to, to be baptized. You say, so what do I do now, Pastor? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And, and not even that, but I think for many of us, our prayer, and, and I know that many of you have prayed this before, what do you want me to do, God? Like, I'll do it. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do next? Where do I go from here? Like, what, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know what my gifts are. I don't know what my talents are. Everybody's talking about spiritual gifts. I don't know what, like, am I gifted in something? I don't know. What do you want me to do? And I'll do it. Does that sound familiar? Anybody prayed that prayer before? Okay, good. We're in the right place. I want to, I, I, I want to tell you a, a few things. First, got to tell you a story. One day, uh, I was at school and I came home. And school was almost out and summer was about to begin. And when I got home, there was just out of the blue a gift sitting on my bed. This is, you know, I'm like 12 years old. And it was a white cloth tool belt, a tape measure, and a 16-ounce hammer that was orange and sitting on my bed and I'm like yeah like this is a rite of passage thing like I got a tool belt I'm a man now and really 
This was my introduction into indentured servitude, right? So, <laughs> I don't know if this was the greatest gift. No, it was. It was a great gift, and I was, I was super pumped about it. So, uh, you know, this was my dad's way of saying, okay, it's time for you to stop sitting around the house. You need to get your butt out there and work. I'm going to show you some things, right? So he probably regrets doing that more than me. I'm sure I cost him more time and money uh, than, than I ever helped with. But I have since completely trashed that tool belt, okay? Uh, forget to put the knife blade up, right? And you cut through the bottom of the bag, go straight through. The tape measure's been destroyed. I broke the handle of that hammer prying on something, and it's all been since gone. And I don't know how many tool belts I've gone through since then. But I know how to use one. I've got one, right? And I had to learn sometime. But this is an interesting, an interesting thing. As I was learning with my little white tool belt on and my hammer, I'm like, okay, what do you want me to do? And in the beginning, like, that was probably not so annoying because, you know, I didn't know. I didn't know what to do. And so I can remember, like, going through and my dad would halfway nail some nails in and leave them exposed, you know. And I could go back like... He said, oh, you got to finish those, you know. So I'd go and I'd nail them in. And then I would, I, I would take a lot of pride in, what do you want me to do next? Well, this is what I want you to do. And go do it and come back. What do you want me to do next? And what I learned was that got annoying. <laughs> Anybody see where I'm going with this? That eventually became annoying. And so at some point, my dad had to say, Open your eyes and see what's going on. I shouldn't have to always tell you what to do next. I want to tell you that, that we do that in a lot of areas. In fact, let's play, let's play a quick game. It should be interactive. Let's get a couple of these things. All right, so you see this going on. What do you do next? Somebody tell me, this is what I see. What am I going to do? A little bit pixelated. This guy's about to hang some OSB on the ceiling here. What could you do to help? There you go. Grab a nail gun. Go help the guy, right? All right, let's go to the next one here. You see this, what do you do? Somebody's drowning. All right? That's not a question. <laughs> That's not a mermaid wanting to answer the next question. You see this, and we naturally know. Man, we got to jump in and help, all right? One more, I think. What are you going to do? Some of y'all have a different parenting style. I'm going to take that kid out and whip his butt. He's throwing a fit. No, no. Help him with his homework. Okay? Help the kid with his homework. We do this in all of our lives, right? We see what's going on. I mean, this is what we were taught to do at work. This is what we teach our kids to do, right? Like, stop asking me what to do next. You have a mind. You have eyes. Look around. And I think that sometimes... Now, I... No, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to jump ahead of myself. I'm going to stick to my notes here. But sometimes it's okay to use the creative mind that God gave you and to look around in the context that God has placed you in and say, oh, there's someone drowning. I think I'll jump in and save them. There's somebody hanging some sheetrock. I think I'll go nail that up for him. There's somebody who is looking for Christ. I think I'll go show them. There's a neighbor who's struggling with depression. I think I'll go visit them. There's some children who have no parental guidance. I think I'll give them a job. I think, you know, uh, whatever it is, and I think all of us can put ourselves in our context and go, oh man, I've been overlooking that for so long. Stop asking what do I do next? And start asking, what's going on? What is happening around me? And I'm not telling you that God is getting annoyed with your questions. I think that God appreciates your heart. And we are, He is infinitely more intelligent than us. You know, I, I know that God has patience with those things. And so this is not a scold for their own question. I've done this for so long, but sometimes... We just run in circles, run in circles, run in circles. And I think the reason is a lot of our, our, our questioning has already been answered. Okay? So I'm not trying to take the Holy Spirit out of the equation. Yes, you need to follow God, but you don't have to ask, God, what do you want me to do with my life? He's already told you that one. <laughs> right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment 
is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? We already know. He's already given us the Great Commission. You are to serve God. You're to go and baptize the nations. Where does that start? Starts in your house, starts on your neighborhood, starts on your block, starts in your church, starts in your workplace. Okay? So there are some things that we can skip ahead of. You can take the CLEP test here. You can get ahead. You can stop asking those questions. I feel very confident and very comfortable telling you, stop asking God, what do you want me to do with my life? It's already answered. Right? You need to be a minister. That's what we are first. As a Christian, I am a follower of Christ. Now I can start asking stuff like, all right, God, as I look around, I see that I go to work and I've got at least a dozen people who have no idea who you are. How do I tell them about you? Now we're asking the right questions. But to have that going on and put it aside, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? It's not the right question. You already know what you're supposed to do. Does that make sense? So maybe we can track with this. Okay. So stop asking what do you want me to do and start looking around and say, what is happening? Okay, I want to take you through this. I'm going to try to be as, as brief as possible but still make this uh, make sense. Here is what has happened so far in your life. Because there are some things that happened in your life that took place before your life that you need to understand so that you can know what's going on in your life. Confused? Me too. Okay, here's what is happening. I told you guys, like I tell you every week, there's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament. And the Old Testament is when God chose His people and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring a Messiah one day. Well, that's an oversimplification. There's a little more to it than that. See, God did choose His people and He chose them to be a priest to the rest of the world. Well, they messed that up. And they ended up having to basically uh, break up into 12 tribes, and one of the tribes was the priest to the other 11. Those were the Hebrew people, Those were, which is why the Old Testament was originally written in the Hebrew language. Okay? And God set some things up for them that would come into play in your life. I want to explain to you what's going on in your life, and it starts way before us. And here's the first thing going on. The first thing going on is you need a temple. Mankind needs a temple. Our people need a temple because the temple is where God dwells. But I thought God was ever. Hold on, track with me. Moses was the leader of the people. God-given leader of the people. God speaks to Moses and says, I want you to make a temple. And, and originally it was a tent. Later along, Solomon came around and he was able to build a permanent temple for the people. But there was kind of the same principle going in both of those. Okay, And so in that temple, I think I have a picture of the temple up here, and I've shown you guys this before. Don't worry, it's not a repeat of what we talked about before, so hang with me. In this temple, there were some rooms where everyone could go, but there was a place right here in yellow called the Most Holy Place, and the Holy Spirit literally dwelt there. So it wasn't like we know it now because we ask and invite the Holy Spirit to come here in a dojo in this service in our hearts, right? So that's what we know, but that's a kind of a new concept before the Holy Spirit stayed in the temple. Now, He would come to people, but then He would leave, right? He never stayed with anyone until Jesus came. That's the first time he ever stayed. We'll get to that later. But this is where the Holy Spirit placed. Uh, the, the most holy place is where the Holy Spirit was. And only one man, only once a year, could go into the most holy place where the Holy Spirit dwelt. And if he did not first pay for his sins with blood, make a sacrifice to purchase away his sins, then he would have been unworthy and would have died at the presence of God when he walked into the most holy place. So he had to sacrifice this perfect animal, okay? Couldn't have spot, blemish, broken bone, anything, right? He had to sacrifice a perfect animal so that his sins would be paid for, so that he could be clean to go in and be in the presence of God, okay? So this is the old rule. This is like before Jesus came, this is what happened. 
right? And he would go in and sacrifice for everyone's sins. Now, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 6, uh, you can turn there if you want. Maybe just follow along with me. I'll have the scripture on the screen for you. Okay. Now, talking about all of that in the temple. When these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year. And he always, listen to that, he always offered blood for his own sins, and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. Do you understand, even the high priest had sins. I promise you, every human... Minus one, Jesus, has sinned. That's including me, okay? By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. God was using something physical. In the way that I bring this tool belt up to, to kind of show something physical, God was literally using the temple as an illustration, okay? Okay? And as long as the illustration was in place, it wasn't yet the real thing. The people needed a temple because the holy God needed somewhere holy to dwell. You don't put God into, right, into a sinful place. You know, I mean, even like when President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, they took him across the street and they were going to take him into a bar, right? Because he was still alive. They were trying to save his life. And, and the bar owner stopped him at the door and said, you are not going to have it said that the President of the United States died in a bar. And so they took him on to somewhere and, and he passed away later in a room, right? That's just the President of the United States. Like the Holy God needed a perfect place. So even somebody who entered in to be in the presence of God had to first get rid of all of their sins. Okay? Does this make sense? So this was, this was the system. Now, we need a temple. And we still need a temple. We needed one back then. We still need one now. But, you guys aren't going to a temple. Are you? So what's different? Why is it now okay to have a dragon on our wall? <laughs> How does this work? The second thing I want to show you is Jesus made a way. Jesus made a way into the temple. Check out Matthew chapter 27 verse 50. Many of you have never seen this before. Okay? Uh, Jesus dying on the cross in, in Matthew chapter 27 in verse 50 we see this. Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. In other words, he died. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, and the rocks split apart. So that part in yellow earlier, that most holy place, was separated by a gigantic curtain. It was about 40 foot tall. In fact, I think it was exactly 40 feet tall. And uh, it split. As soon as he dies, as soon as his spirit is released... The curtain splits from top to bottom. What's the significance in top to bottom? There ain't nobody doing that on their own, right? Maybe from bottom to top, but it splits from top to bottom. Okay? Something has been done. Jesus has now, the cat's out of the bag, right? The Holy Spirit was separated, and now, boom, the veil is torn. The Holy Spirit is no longer in the temple. Jesus has just made a way for us to get to the Holy Spirit. The, the curtain is torn. Anybody can go in. Or anybody can get out. See where I'm headed with this? Jesus had to do that. Now, here's the interesting part. The Holy Spirit dwells in the Holy of Holies. Jesus <coughs> tears the curtain. And the Holy Spirit and man no longer have a separation, but still need a temple. The Holy Spirit is still the Holy Spirit. God is still holy and too good for sin. So where's the Holy Spirit going to go? Where there's, where there's no sin. Where there's cleanliness. Where could He go? Even the high priest had to pay for his sins before he could go in and visit with the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus was our high priest. Is our high priest. Remember only one man, only one time a year could go in to be with the Holy Spirit and he had to first pay for his sins with a perfect lamb. Jesus had to pay for our sins with his perfect sacrifice. And he didn't just go in and pay for our sins once. See, that's what the, that's what the high priest would do. He would go in once a year and he would pay for the sins of the people. Jesus went in with a perfect sacrifice because after him, you can't get any better. And so he goes in and he pays for our sins for all time. And now the Holy Spirit is no longer in a temple just to make sure that God had the temple torn down. Right? There's no longer a temple that we have to go into. There's no longer a building that we have to go into. But we still need a temple. So where is the new temple? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. If you are a believer, Jesus came in with his blood and sacrificed for your sin. Remember the high priest would go in and he would sacrifice for the sins of all the people. The high priest God went in and for once and for all sacrificed for the sins of all people. If you accept Jesus as your high priest, as your Lord and Savior, he has literally purchased away, bought your sins. And ushered you into the Holy Spirit. And to make it easier, He brought the Holy Spirit to you. You are now the temple. And in you is the Holy of Holies. But remember, you couldn't have sin in there. You couldn't have sin in the Holy of Holies. That's why the Holy Spirit doesn't come and dwell in you unless you have first received Christ as your payment for your sin. Because that makes you holy. Right. Holy cow! <laughs> you are holy. Now, if you walked in here today like me, you don't feel so holy. <laughs> huh? I've desecrated the temple of God. I don't feel so holy. God has made you the new temple every temple needs a priest whoa you're the, you're the preacher you're the priest no you are the temple of God and you are the priest in that temple does that make sense I told you there's some things that happened to you now that happened a long time ago that are affecting you now. And for many of us, the reason we are asking God, what do I do next, is because we know we feel the priestly burden from the Holy Spirit. The Holy of Holies is in you. You need a priest to represent that temple. You're it. God has made a way, and then He leaves you, the priest, instructions. Check out Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and told His disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Those were his disciples. Those were fishermen, tax collectors, and doctors. He said, teach the new disciples. You are the priest of your temple, and you've got to teach your new disciples. We, I didn't even plan on saying this. I'm going to try to be quick when I say this, man. When you were in school, and somebody asked you, now girls, I'm sure you had it totally different. I can't speak from your point of view. Guys, when somebody said, who are you going to marry? You were like, well, this is the kind of athlete I want my child to be. So this is the kind of woman I'm going to pick. You did that, didn't you? How stupid. Right? And so somebody asked, you know, what's your point for your kids? Or what is your, you know, or what school do you want your kids to go to? Or what do you want your kids to learn? What college do you want them to go to? It all revolves around sports, right? Isn't that, isn't that kind of funny? 
Your goal for your children is to teach them as the priests of the temple that they attend. There is a heaven so much better than Fenway Park. There is an eternity so much better than anything we can muster up. That's our goal. And that, that was free. I don't even know that. was just kind of in my spirit. I had to say that. Jesus has made a way to the Holy Spirit. He made you the temple. And every temple needs a priest. So what does that look like? Now this is where we get to the nuts and bolts portion. This is the practical stuff. Here's what that looks like. Go to our first picture back there. Here's a guy. Jesus goes across the lake one day and he goes over. There's a lot of tombs, a lot of rocks, and there's a crazy dude who lives there. We call him the demon-possessed man. There's a lot of demon-possessed men in the Bible, but this dude was off the chain. Literally, he'd broken his chains. Okay, This guy was super demon-possessed, why do you say that? Because literally when Jesus cast the demon out of him, multiple came in. They, they, there were so many demonic entities of some sort in him that they had to run out and they filled an entire herd of pigs. And when Jesus called to the demon inside and said, Who are you? They replied, We are legion. Like when somebody starts saying, We are? <laughs> okay, Schmeagle, this is getting weird. Like... <laughs> But this demon-possessed man, I mean, God frees him of all this stuff, and he would cut himself, and he broke his chains, and everybody knew he was crazy, and nobody would go over there because of the crazy dude. And then Jesus cast him free, and in Mark chapter 5, verse 18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, Jesus is leaving now, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it! we got to stop, because isn't that us, right? So if you're, if you're in here, and God has been resonating in your spirit, you're like... Man, he set me free from something. i got to do something. And so we go, just like this dude, and we're like, what do you want me to do now? Let me go with you. What do you want me to do now? What do you want me to do now? What do you want me to do now? But Jesus said, no. Go home to your family. That'll preach. Go home to your family. What do you want me to do now? Go home to your family. And tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. What do you want me to do now? Go home to your family. And he goes home to his family and he tells his family and he goes, more people need to know. And he goes and visits all the villages around him and begins to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. He saw a piece of sheetrock hanging with no nails in it, and somebody's standing there, right? And he said, I got a hammer. I see what needs to be done. Here's another guy, the, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, as many of you know, uh, actually killed and martyred Christians. One day as he was going to uh, Damascus, a great city, He was blinded by a light. He had a meeting with Jesus. Something came over his eyes. God told Paul, go see Ananias. I believe it was Ananias, wasn't he? And Ananias spoke over him and something like scales fell off of his eyes. And then he dedicated his life to Jesus. He had an encounter with Jesus. And then he goes off and studies for a while and, and still doesn't quite know what to do, right? And then as he begins to serve, God begins to direct him. So he goes, he goes to Asia and he's going to minister to Asia. And the Holy Spirit says, no, I want you to go into Macedonia. And so he goes into Macedonia and, and then Paul, through his work in Macedonia, becomes uh, Forbes magazine's most influential man of the millennium. He, he literally was. Okay. He began to move. We, we call this Christian synergy, right? We're just standing there going, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Go walk! <laughs> like, go! Go home and look. Take a look around and see what he's in and let the Holy Spirit direct you. I'm not taking, trying to take the Holy Spirit out of the equation. I'm saying some things we don't have to ask. God has changed your life. Go home and proclaim it. And then the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal things to you, right? Remember the old tractor? Anybody ever plow with an old tractor when it's parked and it has no power steering? Can you turn the wheels? It's tough, isn't it? You start going, sometimes you just hit a rock and it'll turn it, right? It's called synergy. As you go, it's easier to be steered. 
1 Corinthians 9.27, this is Paul speaking. He said, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. What do I need to do now? No matter what you need to do, you need to work on yourself. We need to work on ourselves, right? Synergy. Go. Here's another guy. This guy was deaf. Jesus comes up and gives the man back his hearing. Can you imagine how life-changing that would be? Mark chapter 7, 36, Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone... But the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes it deaf to hear and give speech to those who cannot speak. If you have had an encounter with Jesus, sometimes you just do the natural thing and tell people about what you've seen. When you've had an encounter with Jesus, you can't help but talk about it. Last one, I'll show you guys. Just, just a quick thing. Paul gets thrown into prison. His buddy Silas is there. They're singing and praising God. Earthquake happens. Jail cell opens up. The jailer, who they began to befriend, is freaking out. Acts 16, verse 29. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You're like, whoa, this is weird. No, understand that had they left, the jailer would have been executed. Paul and Silas stayed. They had a new friend they had to take care of, right? So God opens the doors. The guy is like, holy cow, the God that you're serving is real. And he goes in and he's like, I want what you guys have. What do I have to do to be saved? Verse 31, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. The jailer didn't walk in and go, You guys left! That's awesome! What do I do next? He saw what was going on and he said, How do I get what you got? And they began to preach to him. And he, he accepted that. He believed it. And then he goes, Okay, what do I do next? No. He went and said, you got to tell my family. So he leaves the jail. He takes these people to his home. And says, you got to tell my family. And so they tell the family. And the family accepts. And then they all believe. So they say, how do we be baptized? So they get baptized right there. And then he looks at them and says, man, we need to minister you guys. And begins to take care of their wounds. I don't have any more of the story from the jailer from this place. The Philippian jailer kind of is, is off the map as far as I know in the Bible. But look at what he did. It was so natural. He didn't stand around asking, God, what do you want me to do next? What do you want me to do next? He looked and he saw what was right there in front of him. And he began to minister. And I'm going to tell you guys, just from experience, as you look, you see, you respond in the name of Jesus, that is when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to you, to minister to you. That's when you begin to have dreams and visions. That's when you start praying over people and they get healed. That's when you see the big things. I don't know why God set it up that way. Like in my opinion, it was like, alright God, show me the big fireworks and then I'll go. Then I'll do something. And He says, no, without faith is impossible to please me. And I'm like, well, without you doing something cool, how am I supposed to have faith, right? His way is better than mine. And so for many of us, we're looking at this like, man, I, I, you know, I, I, I believe in Jesus, but I just don't know what to do now. Go ahead, uh, worship team, you guys go ahead and come up. And so for, for many of you, if you walked into this place today and you're like, hey, I, I don't even know if I believe in God, I don't know, you get a free pass today. You just get to set in judgment over the Christians. That feels good, right? So, but if you are a Christian in this place Many of us have found ourselves just begging God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Go home and tell your family what has happened. 
Go to the seven villages around you and tell them that God has set you free. Go to your neighbors. Go to the first place where somebody will lend an ear to hear about what God has done and begin to tell them. And as you begin to minister and as God begins to use you, you will see the Holy Spirit show up in your life in ways that you have never seen. And it won't just be somebody else coming up to the stage, somebody else testifying about something cool that God has done. It will begin to happen to you. Well, Pastor, you seem pretty confident when you say that. I absolutely am confident. God lives in a temple. Jesus made you that temple. And every temple needs a priest. You are that priest. So go preach. I'm going to ask God that he will give us an audience in our mind even now. Let's just pray together. Father, as we begin to uh, just just enter into a, a time of, of listening to you, Father, I pray that you will speak. God, we've done this before and you did that. You begin to speak to people. I pray, Father, that you will set us up with divine appointments that you will place on our hearts even now. Family that we have neglected, friends, neighbors that we've neglected, co-workers that need to hear about you, Father. And I pray that we will have the boldness to begin to minister to them, to carry out your work for your name's sake. Father, just flood our minds. Show us, God. Give us the big picture of what's going on. God, you have us. Fill our spirits, Father. We don't we don't want normal anymore. We ask this in Jesus' name. These guys are going to play in just a minute. And when they do, some people are going to come forward and they've got offering baskets. If you're new here, we don't give anybody to shake down. We don't roll like that. But if you are a Christian, part of the way that we worship is through giving because God is worthy of that. Uh, but also, if you have anything you would like to let the church know, man, maybe you have a prayer, re uh, prayer request, a praise report, you say, you know, it's time for me to be baptized. It's time for me to accept the Lord. Would you respond to us? We, we, we're not going to show up at your door. We just want to give you a call, shoot you an email, respond with us, and drop that in that plate when it comes by. You guys stand and worship with us.